Good morning, friends, and welcome to a morning edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron. You know the drill. I'm a retired New York City police detective, and if you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron when I go live and upload another video. This morning, there is going to be a press conference held by the Suffolk County District Attorney Raymond Tierney. He is going to go over some new developments in the Gilgo Beach murder case. Rex Hureman is standing accused and tried for three out of four, the Gilgo Four murders. We don't know if today he is going to announce the charges on the fourth victim, which is Maureen Brainard Barnes, or uh, from what I'm getting from law enforcement, good, solid law enforcement sources, that uh, they have identified Fire Island Jane Doe. That's Jane Doe number seven. And we're going to get into it in a few moments. But I want to say a special thank you to uh, the Patreon supporters, the channel members, the subscribers, the mods, the replay viewers, the folks who leave super chats and super thanks after the videos are over. So at 1030 P, uh, AM here in New York, that's Eastern Standard Time, just in a, a short period of time, about 20 minutes from now, we'll have live coverage of this press conference and we'll listen to it live together and we'll also have a little bit of a Q&A and some uh, of my um, take on what Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney, uh, what he puts out and we may hear from the police commissioner, I hope. We may hear from uh, the task force members, possibly the FBI, state police, Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. This task force is comprised of all of those agencies. So um, again, let's say thank you to everybody that's coming in. Robbie, thank you for the super sticker. Much appreciated. Thank you. Hello, Janine. Uh, Cat747, thank you for being here. Uh, Debbie, good to see you. Um, I'm going to go over Jane Doe uh, number seven right now. Um, so it's good that you asked that question because we're going to get into it right now. Um, so Jane Doe number seven, better known as Fire Island Jane Doe, uh, she was, um, her remains were discovered on April 20th of 1996. Two female legs wrapped in plastic wrapped in plastic, were discovered on the Bayside shore of Fire Island, one mile west of Davis Park Beach uh, in Suffolk County. She was given the name Fire Island Jane Doe. That's 1996, uh, folks. Um, multiple scars were noted on the victim's legs. These were two legs, right leg and a left leg. And there is, um, again, multiple scars noted on the, the victim's legs. But now a skull uh, many years later, uh, the same victim skull would be later found April 11th of 2011, west of Tobey Beach in Nassau County. Um, and here she was named at that time, Jane Doe number seven. The DNA testing linked both of these sets of remains. They linked the legs along with the skull that was recovered. So 1996, Fast forward to 2011, uh, and let's listen to a piece by Mary Murphy. She did some great coverage on this. It's a three and a half mile ferry ride from Patchogue in Suffolk County, an isolated haven on the eastern end of Fire Island. Davis Park is a very tight knit community. It's the best place on earth, really. It's the best kept secret in town of Brookhaven. Wayne Lunati, the marina director, has been coming to Davis Park on the Great South Bay since the 1950s. But even he didn't know about Davis Park's ties to a baffling murder mystery. This area may have been a starting point for the Long Island serial killer without anyone realizing it at the time. 20 years ago, in 1996, two female legs were found here wrapped in plastic. Years later, during the serial killer investigation, a skull that was found in Tobey Beach was tested for DNA, and that DNA was matched later to the legs here in Davis Park. Shocked. 
And why do you say that? Because it's a quiet community. There's no cars out here in order to get here. The only way to get here is by boat. Davis Park is a boater's paradise with more than 200 slips. This map shows Davis Park is 22.9 miles east of Tobey Beach, which is located in Nassau County. The female skull in Tobey was found in 2011. The Davis Park Marina director believes the victim's legs drifted here all those years earlier. I don't think they were dumped here at all. Why? It's, it's too far out of the way. Could have drifted anywhere. It happened to end up here. The Long Island serial killer, known by the acronym LISK, did not become part of the public consciousness until December 2010, when four Craigslist escorts, their bodies intact and wrapped in burlap, were discovered in the bramble off Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach. <laughs> Suffolk County police have been searching for missing escort Shannon Gilbert, who was last seen running and screaming from a client's house in Oak Beach on May 1st, 2010, yelling, they're trying to kill me. Six other bodies or body parts were found in 2011 before Gilbert's remains were discovered in a marsh in Oak Beach. The Suffolk County medical examiner ruled her death a drowning. An independent coroner retained by Gilbert's family said it's very likely she was strangled since her hyoid bone was missing. And despite a shakeup in the top ranks of the Suffolk County Police Department and a guilty plea by the former chief for assaulting a suspect, the Suffolk PD remains in charge of the serial killer investigation, even though the FBI has been invited back in to assist. And 20 years ago this summer, the quiet hamlet of Davis Park may actually have been the place where it all began, long before Gilgo became synonymous with an elusive killer. I'm Mary Murphy, PIX11 News. So that was some really good coverage from Mary Murphy on PIX11. And, you know, I always, um, I always link to her, um, her news reporting because Mary Murphy has been on this story from the beginning, WPIX, that's News 11 New York. So if you're looking for anything uh, good as it pertains to this, um, you know, there's, a, there's so many groups and so many um, uh, people out there speaking about Jane Doe number seven and, you know, all of the victims. And I said last night uh, with Ed Wallace and Jared Bradley, the president of MVAC, that's the vacuum that is a DNA vacuum, um, it's important that we get closure for the remaining seven victims. And if there's any more, we need to get closure. But as it, as it stands, this press conference with Suffolk County District Attorney Tierney, uh, we, we feel that uh, strongly that these two topics are going to be uh, discussed. And we're going to get updates on whether the new charges, um, as it pertains to Maureen Brainerd Barnes, uh, are going to now be charged against defendant Rex Hureman, innocent until proven guilty. But um, strong information is that Jane Doe number seven uh, has been identified. Now we will have a name for uh, Jane Doe number seven, and I'm going to um, I'm going to show her photograph. And this is an artist rendering, obviously, um, of her. And you know. It, it's sad because these uh, families are, are looking for closure. And uh, here it is, the photograph, uh, and it's an artist rendering uh, from the remains that they recovered. And, you know, again, we send strength, prayers, and positive vibes to the families. Uh, it, it, it's it's sad. And, and here's um, a great link and a resource. It's gilgocase.com. I have um, all of this linked in every description of all of my videos. So let's come on here and we got another 15 minutes or so, maybe give or take a little bit um, before we have this press conference. We're going to give it to you live. There's going to be no interruptions. We're going to listen to it. Um, let me say thank you to all the super chatters. Um, I want to verbally thank Robbie. Gemma's journey in grace, love from the UK. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Robbie. KNS, thank you for the $20 super sticker. Always appreciate your love and support. Gemma's journey, Grace, over in the UK. She's got a great channel. She goes live all the time. Uh, and she is um, an advocate for the autistic, autistic community. Her, she herself is autistic. So thank you, Gemma, for all you do, for all of the 
you know, uh, all of the awareness that you spread. Thank you. A lot of love from my house to yours. Uh, Terry, thank you for being a, a member and thank you for whoever gifted. I think someone gifted out a membership. Thank you for that. Um, and then there was 10 gifted memberships from MMM Rhino Girl. Thank you for being very kind and generous. Kurt, thank you for that super chat. M much appreciated. Debbie, Deb Reads, thank you for the super sticker. And Jakey, Jakey5, thank you for your support from across the pond. Diane Banks, uh, D Banks, uh, in the in the building. D, D Banks, great friend, member for 10 months. She says, love this channel and my crime family. Well, a lot of love right back to you. Um, so after we after we do um, the press conference, folks, um, KM uh, Price, thank you for becoming a channel member, and Donna Shaw, thank you for the super sticker. Um, but after we listen to this press conference, we're going to have a little bit of a q and A. I I want to ask you your questions, uh, what your thoughts are on what Ray Tierney says, the Suffolk County District Attorney, and anything that we hear from um, some of the, the the folks who we hear from today. Um, and I'm going to do, I like the town hall meeting. Um, I like that town hall meeting kind of format. Uh, so if you guys want to come up one at a time, I'll, I'll get, you know, maybe two or three or four of you guys to come on up and we'll ask these questions about what we just listened to. And I think that's a great part of live interactive live streaming, because it's not always about just hearing the information and by a show of hands who watched the DNA uh, MVAC forensic live stream last night that we did. It was Ed Wallace, Jared Bradley, the president and CEO of MVAC Systems, and myself. And put a one in the chat if you watched it. Scott, I know you did. Uh, Timmy Acosta, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Vamp Flyer, thank you for becoming a channel member. I appreciate that. Um, so a lot of people have watched it. Japanda, Japanda, she says she watched it. Sweet Caroline. Wow, a lot of you guys saw it. Um, Kevin, Kevin saw it. Allison, of course, always here. And Allison, thank you for all of your support. Um, the super thanks uh, came in uh, after the live was over. Uh, thank you for that generous super super thanks. I'm going to put the camera down when we go. I'm leaving here at about noon to head to Connecticut. Yeah, Lynn, it was a good one. I I agree, it was a really good one. Um, so let me scan the news to see what's happening. Uh, I want to see if you guys know of any news outlet that's doing the actual live coverage. I have a bunch of them ready and in the hopper, ready to go. News 12 Long Island is kind of my go-to uh, cut when it comes to coverage for this. Uh, I'm sure WPIX is going to have it too. Um, but uh, News 12 is a Long Island news outlet, right? So hopefully they'll have it live. If they don't have it live, I'll keep looking around to see um, who, what, what, you know, what major network is covering it. But I believe what we're going to be hearing today is an update. Uh, Jane Doe number seven, as I said, I believe that uh, we're going to hear some breaking and new information uh, identification. And, and we know from the show last night, Vintage Mama of Three, thank you for becoming a channel member and thank you all for the support here. Uh, yeah, uh, Dennis, the re retired Irish detective, the MVAC was fascinating. Um, but, you know, uh, again, like I said, you know, forensics is going to play a huge role. Computer forensics, we know already has played a huge role, but forensics as it pertains to DNA and hairs and fibers and so forth, that is going to be huge in this case, because as Ed Wallace, the great Ed Wallace always says, that Lacarge exchange principle is in effect with everything. So Rex Hurman, and if there's any unidentified um, additional uh, perpetrators that are out there, DNA in, in, in that transfer and exchange is recovered due to new technology. We know Suffolk County Police Crime Lab, New York State Crime Lab, they both, it's been confirmed by the president of MVAC, who was on the show last night, that they have the MVAC DNA vacuum in their arsenal. So you know that they are using this as as it pertains to this case, they're using that technology. 
So uh, shout out to forensics, says a vamp flyer. Absolutely. 100% shout out to forensics. Uh, let's listen to a little piece um, from uh, Lauren. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to go to the Suffolk County um, jail. Uh, I want to show you guys the inside of a jail cell where Rex Hurman is staying. This is uh, his cozy little um, his cozy little comforts. I'm going to show this to you guys because I'm trying to uh, wait and search for the um, press conference, which is in about 10 minutes. Uh, this is just two minutes long, so let's let this play. Here we go. This is going to show you inside the Suffolk County Jail where Rex Hurman is lodged. You're about to see a part of the Gilgo Beach serial murder case we have not seen or talked about before. It is the human trafficking unit of Suffolk County Police Department that has in fact identified some of the young women linked to the accused killer, Rex Hurman. Sex workers, that's the politically correct term, but the truth is some of them are young women caught up in a human trafficking ring. Here's Long Island reporter Shantae Lands. Thousands of women have been incarcerated inside two jails in Suffolk County. It's a dark time for many, but a chance to identify and help. So this is a look at a typical cell in the Suffolk County uh, jail. I've been in there many a times picking up prisoners. I worked in the trip team. This is the... This, this is the cells. They're all the same. A stainless steel sink, a stainless steel toilet, a small little cold, hard desk, a really nasty smelling um, piece of bedding that is not, uh, you don't get any covers, you get no blankets, you get no pillows. The pillow is built in right here and they just clean it off. So this is a typical Suffolk County jail cell victims of human trafficking we've been able to identify 315 um, victims and 192 traffickers investigative sergeant aaron menkel heads the human trafficking unit they may have been a sex worker making their own money and sometimes the trafficker will then prey upon that sometimes the traffickers will get them um, initiated in the trade the unit is comprised of all women three female correctional officers in constant search of the signs. While they're here, our safety investigators walk through daily, checking in on them, seeing uh, whatever in custody support we can give. And then by the. Our, our DNAC says no sheets? Question mark. Yuck. Sheets can be used to hang uh, oneself. So sheets are not uh, typically um, given out to uh, prisoners or inmates, especially, you know, Rex Hurman is in. Uh, on on uh, suicide watch, right? So they have him under evaluation 24-7. Uh, there's correction officers that check on him on a regular basis. So yeah, no uh, no bed sheets. You don't. You're not getting a thousand um, uh, a, a thousand sh uh, sh uh, thread um, linens. You know, two thousand. Uh, you know, two thousand <laughs> two thousand uh, sheet linens. You're not getting that. Uh, it's not uh, it's not anything comfortable. At the end of the week, they take them out and do a one on one interview with everyone. Slowly gaining their trust, even identifying several sex workers who encountered accused Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Hurman. We had reached out to them uh, to, for sex. Uh, fortunately for these two women, they uh, took the calls but did not uh, meet with him. Sheriff Errol Toulon launched the unit in 2018. Did you ever think that your human trafficking unit would help in the Gilgo Beach investigation? You know, when we first created this in 2018, we started to try and formulate some questions without knowing anything because there was no task force. But then once the task force was created, it really helped. Hurman is housed in Suffolk jail. The architect and father of two pleaded not guilty to three murders. He remains on suicide watch. So our mental health staff will be evaluating him. Uh, you know, most recently because he just had a court date yesterday to make sure that he's still okay. Rex Hurman is staying in a single cell just like this one. Nothing but a toilet, sink, window, and a bed. Hey, at least he's got a window, right? So there's a better look at the actual cell. Uh, these cells are um, recently updated and upgraded because uh, a lot of the cells, you know, that you see have the bars, you know, and it locks in. This has an actual door with a window. 
Um, so it's a little bit, they say, the, the, I'm going to bring it back. They say it's a little more um, where you, 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 you have a, a look at the outside. Um, the bars obviously um, are, are, are more dangerous for the actual um, correction officers because inmates can throw things at them like feces and urine um, and other uh, things that they may have from their commissary. So this is safer for not only the inmates, but more importantly for the uh, prison staff. Uh, so this this is the new, um, the, these are new. Um, used to be, again, metal gates uh, that would go and prisoners could put their hands out and so forth. So this is, uh, this is supposedly, you know, obviously safer. She woman is staying in a single cell just like this one. Nothing but a toilet, sink, window, and a bed. No visits from Huroman's family, just his attorney, but others have tried. There have been some journalists and some other individuals that he's refused to um, actually uh, see. So journalists and some random people he's refused to see. Uh, basically, he's just had contact with his attorney. Uh, that other individuals that he's refused to um, actually uh, see. Did he know those individuals? Uh, that I do not know uh, whether he knows them or not, but he refused the visits. Meaningful work for Sergeant Minkle. So many women have told us that jail has actually saved their lives. So there you have it, folks. Uh, I'm going to go straight over to the press conference because I believe that it's getting ready to be queued up. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, messages from people on Newsday. I have them all in the hopper here. So um, I'm going to take a peek right now at Newsday, see what we got. Long Island. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. So I have it here on the hopper coming up in uh, Gilgo Beach Investigation News Conference. This is Newsday TV. So um, we're going to have it live when it is live. And so I'll keep watching this on the side. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll do this. How about that? Keep it so. Okay, here we go. Good morning, I'm Jasmine Anderson. Breaking news now out of Suffolk County. The DA's office, police, and other law enforcement officials are having a news conference on new details of the Gilgo Beach killings. They're expected we'll to talk about the identification uh, the of another of, victim. Uh, Let's take a listen. Been known as Fire Island Jane Doe. Um, you know, on April 20th, 1996, uh, female remains consisting of uh, legs uh, and feet were found on the bayside shore of Fire Island, about a mile west of Davis Park Beach. Uh, then approximately 15 years later, on April 11, 2011, uh, additional remains consisting of a skull were discovered at Tobe Beach in Nassau County. Uh, those remain, that skull was found uh, following the discovery of the remains of Jessica Taylor, and the skull was found on the same day as uh, the remains of what is uh, commonly come to be referred to as peaches was found on Jones Beach. Uh, in uh, Thereafter, in July of 2011, the Suffolk County Crime Lab linked this, uh, the two sets of remains uh, via DNA analysis. And by that, I mean uh, the uh, legs that were found uh, in the vicinity of Davis Park were compared with the remains found at Tobey Beach, and it was determined that uh, it was the same person. Since 2011, uh, that victim was known by various names, including Fire Island uh, Jane Doe. Uh, today, uh, we are here to announce that as part of the Gilgo Task Force re-examination of all the evidence in the case, we were able to identify Fire Island Jane Doe as Karen Vergata, who was 34 years old at the time of her disappearance. I believe we have a, a picture of, of Miss Vergata. I think it's important uh, that we remember and honor not only Miss Vergata, but all the victims uh, on Gilgo Beach. Uh, Ms. Vergata went missing at approximately uh, February 14th, uh, 1996. At the time, she lived on West 45th Street in Manhattan and was believed to be working as an escort at the time of her disappearance. Uh, there was no missing persons complaint filed at the time of that disappearance. 
uh, in August of 2022, approximately six months after we formed this Gilgo Task Force, a DNA profile suitable for genealogical comparison was developed from the remains of Karen Vergata. In September of 2022, the FBI was able to was able uh, via a genetic genealogy review to identify Ms. Vergata presumptively as Fire Island Jane Doe. Thereafter, in October of 2022, uh, using a buccal swab from a uh, a relative of uh, Karen Vergata, we were able to uh, definitively identify her. Uh, prior to disclosing this information, of course, we needed to contact all of Ms. Vergata's family members. And additionally, uh, at, or, at or around the same time, uh, we were beginning our, uh, our uh, grand jury confidential investigation into what has been known as the Gilgo Four, that is the murders of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, so we decided we were not going to make any public comment at this time. However, since that, uh, the results of that investigation have become public and we have made the necessary notifications to Ms. Vergata's family, uh, we, can, we can make this uh, important announcement now. Um, I just wanna thank uh, in particular, Special Agent Lori, Gier, uh, Lori Giordano from the FBI uh, in her work with the uh, familial DNA. She worked in conjunction with uh, our Suffolk County Crime Lab, uh, Don Dollar, Dollar of the Suffolk County Crime Lab, his team in coordination with the Suffolk County Police Department's Homicide Unit. Uh, so I want to thank them uh, for, uh, in particular for all of, of their work. Of course, I want to thank our task force members, uh, Suffolk County Sheriff Errol Toulon, uh, uh, ASAC uh, Spencer, uh, Spencer Horn from the FBI. I want to thank the uh, New York State Police, uh, Suffolk County Police Department, uh, Rodney Harrison, who couldn't make it here. I understand Chief Rowan is here in his, his place instead. Uh, but I want to thank them uh, for uh, not only their work on this case, but it, for all their work in the task force uh, going forward. Um, it's important to note that there are no charges uh, at this time. Uh, Ms. Vergata's disappearance was in 1996, which is 27 years ago. Uh, we are going to continue to work this particular case as we did the Gilgo 4 investigation. Um, we're going to have no comment on what, if any, suspects we developed at this time. Uh, this is a confidential investigation, so I'm not going to be taking any questions, but our investigation is continuing, and thank you all very much. <laughs> uh, no questions. Uh, if you want to talk about you know, something regarding the Gilgo Four, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk offline to you, but today this is about, this press conference is about uh, Ms. Vergata, and uh, you know that we've been able to identify her and that we're continuing our investigation not only with regard to uh, the Gilgo Four, but all of the uh, the victims on on Gilgo. So thank you all very much. Nothing else to say about Ms. Vergata? Hey, so folks, Shannon, our deputy press uh, secretary, has a digital version of this, which she can send out to you all. Um, I, we can either do it just to our press list, which you probably are already on, or if you want to give your emails, we can do it in Got the She went missing forever, February so. 14th of 1996. That's well, 27 we'll the, years the ago. Joining me right yeah. now is columnist Joy Brown to talk more about this. Joy. Well, it's great. a couple of interesting things here. One, the fact that we have another identification. The other thing is it gives us another inside look into this task force and the secrecy under which this task force has been working. Uh, what the district attorney said was they figured this out in October of 2022. Uh, we are now in, what, August of 2023, and they decided to sort of keep that part to themselves. The other thing they told us is that they made a match or helped figure out to do this. They took some DNA and they ended up swabbing DNA from a relative. So he called it familiar DNA, which would presumably mean that they went to the genetic databases, you know, um, Ancestry, uh, 23andMe, to sort of get us the identification of, of Ms. Vergata. Um, it also tells us that they were doing two things at one time or multiple things at one time, which is they had her identification while at the same time keeping surveillance on the suspect, Rex Hewerman, uh, who has been charged with the Gilgo Four.
And we know no charges have been filed in relation to Jane Doe number seven, which has this. been identified as Kieran Vargada. So no gonna, charges. He was very specific to say that. I would have assumed that would have been the first question. So right now, it seems that he's. we've got a prosecution going on. We've still got the investigation going on into, you remember, there are three sets of remains that remain uh, unidentified. You have peaches this is a torso with a with a tattoo you have a toddler who uh, officials are presumably that this is her child and we also have an asian male so you've got that still going on and now you've got an investigation going on to try to put together and figure out the mystery of what happened to and who was responsible for the death of Ms. Vergata. Yeah, and I don't want to take away from uh, Ms. Vergata because that's what we're here to talk about today. She lived in Manhattan. Uh, she worked as an escort there. Um, and then, of course, in 22, like 2022, as you mentioned, um, the family was then, um, their identity was used, or DNA, I should say, their samples were used to uh, make a comparison to see if this was her. Is this a common practice that is used typically in these situations, or is this uncommon? Well, you're seeing more and more people making use. I want to point out something here real quick. Um, first and foremost, Karen Vergata, may her and all of these victims rest in peace. Now we have a name for Jane Doe number seven. But I want to point out something here, and then I'll let this continue. She was an escort and lived in Manhattan. Let's put a little bit of this together. Just, again, this doesn't... I'm not saying this definitively, but Rex Hureman in 1996, we don't know if he was uh, traveling in and out of Manhattan. Was his office still in Midtown Manhattan? But it's very coincidental that she is an escort. She lived in Manhattan and she disappeared February 14th on Valentine's Day in 1996. Was Rex Hureman's wife away? In 1996, was he even married to her in 1996? Because, again, does all these timelines add up? Her two legs were found April 20th. She goes missing on Valentine's Day of 1996. And then two months later, April 20th, 1996, her legs are in Fire Island, recovered in Fire Island in a plastic bag individually. And then April of 2011, her skull comes in and washes up um, in Nassau County. Interesting, right? Nothing that we know of came as a result of that. Uh, the DA took a look at that belt again uh, and that belt was used on one of the victims. Um, so we're finding a lot out more and more of that. And Newsday's reporting is saying that one of the suspects of the Gilgo Four, Rex Hureman, one, his grandfather, one of his ancestors, had initials and had, so presumably the belt may have belonged to him or may have been passed down from him. That's William Hureman that you're mentioning. That's the correct. Grandfather. Right. Okay, so a lot to take in here today. But again, uh, the Jane Doe, number seven, identified as Karen Vergata. I believe she was 34 at the time. 34. Um, 34 yes. years old. And she her remains were found on Fire Island and Jones Beach back in 1996. So we're going to be talking about this for some time now. This investigation has been going on for more than 13 years at this point. What did you say? Five police commissioners, <laughs> uh, three DAs. I mean, the list goes on. Well, but we today we have a name and we have a face. Yes. And I think that that is significant uh, for all of us. And do you think this is going to maybe, I mean, put a little peace on the family of this young woman? I think it's going to put a little peace on the family and a little more humanity on the rest of us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Joy, for your time. And of course, if you missed any of this, we're going to post this on our website. That's newsday.com. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, again, our prayers and, and 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 positive vibes go out to her surviving family. You know, thirty-four years young, uh, Jane Doe number seven identified. Breaking news as of today as Karen uh, Vergata. 
34 years young uh, and deceased, uh, arguably to uh, February 14th of 1996. Hey guys, uh, joining me live as soon as I get the thumbs up, I'm going to uh, add her into the stream to give her perspective, attorney Melanie Little. Uh, so here's uh, Melanie to join us. Hey Mel, thanks for joining us. Hi. Me. What's your thoughts? Did you see some of the presser? I did. I was in the car and I was listening to you and I was listening to it. So I'm not sure what I missed other than uh, she went missing on Valentine's Day of 1996, which is interesting. And uh, she was one of the victims. I believe that was dismembered, correct? Correct. They found both of her legs washed up in Fire Island, Fire Island wrapped in plastic bags, right. which is, again, not in line with Rex Hureman's MO. Uh, right. You know, no burlap, but also uh, fast forward to 2011, her skull uh, washed up uh, right on the shoreline of uh, Gilgo Beach. So uh, I went over that earlier this morning. Fire Island was, uh, you know, again, in, in, in February. And then we had the skull at Tobey Beach just a little bit past Gilgo uh, on April 11th of 2011. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of, a lot to take in. I was hoping that there was going to be the upgraded, uh, the additional charges for Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Yeah. We didn't hear anything. And, you know, Suffolk County police, com uh, police commissioner did not make a statement. And that is also for me, um, it seems like the DA is, is taking the lead, not only on charging Rex Hurman, but the lead on being the spokesperson for this case. And, and I feel that that's not the best of choice. I would have liked to have heard from the police commissioner, Rodney Harrison. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with you. You know, this is a crime right now. This is not, uh, these are not charges. This is not a legal proceeding. This is a crime that they've been trying to solve since 1996 when those legs washed up on uh, a fire island at Davis Park, I believe, right? Yes. Um, so to me, this is something that I would like to see Rodney Harrison talking about. I'm not sure why the DA has made himself the spokesperson on specifically, you know, this event, but it's curious to me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, again, I, we haven't heard anything from him since the very early initial press conferences. Uh, I think we heard from uh, the police commissioner twice uh, and he's so well-spoken and I really wanted to get some other perspective and let us know in the chat what you guys feel. You know, again, I, I, this this is not in any way, shape or form a bashing session of uh, no. the district attorney, but again, we've heard so much from him. We'd like to hear from the actual police commissioner who's running this task force. The district attorney's office obviously is involved. Their investigators are involved. But they're not running the show. Rodney Harrison is running the show. And I, I think that um, hearing his perspective would help. Hey, I wanted to do this quick. Um, just let everybody take a listen. This is a video with Mary Murphy. Um, this is probably what you missed. But I'm going to do this for the uh, you know advan your advantage so you can hear about Jane Doe number seven because this, this is very good coverage. So let me play this and we'll take it and listen and we'll come right back. I played this in the top part of the show. It's a three and a half mile ferry ride from Patchogue in Suffolk County, an isolated haven on the eastern end of Fire Island. Davis Park is a very tight knit community. It's the best place on earth, really. It's the best kept secret in town of Brookhaven. Wayne Lunati, the marina director, has been coming to Davis Park on the Great South Bay since the 1950s. But even he didn't know about Davis Park's ties to a baffling murder mystery. This area may have been a starting point for the Long Island serial killer without anyone realizing it at the time. 20 years ago, in 1996, two female legs were found here wrapped in plastic. Years later, during the serial killer investigation, a skull that was found in Tobey Beach was tested for DNA. And that DNA was matched later to the legs here in Davis Park. Shocked. And why do you say that? Because it's a quiet community. There's no cars out here in order to get here. The only way to get here is by boat. Davis Park is a boater's paradise with more than 200 slips. 
This map shows Davis Park is 22.9 miles east of Tobe Beach. All right, I got to stop this just for a second because Magical Mary, thank you for that question. And, and I, the reason I'm stopping is because I saw multiple people. In, there's, so there's no confusion. She was reported missing on February 14th of 1996. Her legs were discovered and found on April 20th of 1996. So yes, we are going to say that she was killed sometime between February 14th, the last time she was saw, seen alive and reported missing, to April 20th of 1996. That narrows down the possible, we don't know, cause and manner of death, obviously. The reporters asked that as he was you know, walking away. We, they asked, where was she killed? Um, they asked several questions that he refused to answer. And, and, and I, don't, I don't find any fault in him not answering that because he's under no obligation to answer it. Uh, the more he says, the worse it could be with this case and charging it and going forward. So that was smart. Uh, but curiosity, right, Melanie? We all want to know. Yeah. These are yeah. questions we want to know. Uh, Magical Mary, thank you for that. Let's let the rest of this play. And I think this is giving us a very good overview. And this is not brand new. This was done some time ago. But uh, uh, kudos to Mary Murphy. She's a, a fantastic uh, investigative reporter, and she's been on this case since the beginning. Which is located in Nassau County. The female skull in Tobe was found in 2011. The Davis Park Marina director believes the victim's legs drifted here all those years earlier. I don't think they were dumped here at all. Why? It's it's too far out of the way. Could have drifted anywhere. It happened to end up here. The Long Island serial killer, known by the acronym LISK, did not become part of the public consciousness until December 2010, when four Craigslist escorts, their bodies intact and wrapped in burlap, were discovered in the bramble off Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach. <laughs> Suffolk County police have been searching for missing escort Shannon Gilbert, who was last seen running and screaming from a client's house in Oak Beach on May 1st, 2010, yelling, they're trying to kill me. Six other bodies or body parts were found in 2011 before Gilbert's remains were discovered in a marsh in Oak Beach. The Suffolk County medical examiner ruled her death a drowning. An independent coroner retained by Gilbert's family said it's very likely she was strangled since her hyoid bone was missing. And despite a shakeup in the top ranks of the Suffolk County Police Department and a guilty plea by the former chief for assaulting a suspect, the Suffolk PD remains in charge of the serial killer investigation, even though the FBI has been invited back in to assist. And 20 years ago this summer, the quiet hamlet of Davis Park may actually have been the place where it all began, long before Gilgo became synonymous with an elusive killer. I'm Mary Murphy, PIX11 News. So that was a, a fantastic uh, report uh, on this, uh, on Jane Doe 7, and also all of the other victims. Um, Melanie, again, today we, I put it in the title. I was, I actually reached out to one of my own people who I worked with that now work close in this investigation. And he couldn't really say much to me, but he basically said the cat's out of the bag. NBC had reported it early this morning um, that a source close to this investigation um, stated that Jane Doe number seven was going to be uh, identified here in this press conference. I put in the title new charges with the question mark because I was hoping and praying that Rex Hurman would be uh, held uh, in, 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 you know, charged with Maureen Brainard Barnes. Uh, but the, we, we're just waiting and we have to wait patiently. And Melanie, I wanted to get some yeah. more thoughts because a lot of people look to you uh, from the attorney's perspective on that. With regard to the new charges, yeah. yeah. The issue is that Maureen Brainard Barnes was the first young woman to go missing. She went missing in 2007. And at the time that the bodies were found in 2010, all four of them were found at the same time. She had been there for the longest time in the marsh in the Bramble. So at the time that the bodies were found, for some reason, they did not collect her cell phone data at that time. And then later when they went back to get it, it was no longer available because the cell phone carriers have certain retention policies and it was past the date that they could recover that data. So now what they're doing is trying to piece together other evidence 
to tie her back to Hureman as well. But that's a process. It's going to take yeah. time. We've been told, you know, he's the DA has slipped a couple of times and said that the jury process is ongoing, which makes me think that they are currently hearing the case and it's going to come down soon. But that's kind of anyone's guess. I think um, we're hoping for that. And I'm hoping that's going to be soon. I thought I think we both thought we were going to hear about that today. Right. We but, were hoping for sooner than later. Yeah, absolutely. Just to clarify something. So Karen, is it Vergata with a B or Vergata with a V? It's a V, a Vergata, V-E-R-G-A-T-A. Okay, so, so Karen Vergata's legs uh, were found in 96. Her skull was found in 2011. They've never found her torso or any other body parts. Is that correct? That is correct. That so is correct. here's what's interesting to me. She goes missing, and, and this is significant too because it's Valentine's Day in 1996. Right. which is significant. And I'm going past uh, uh, through all my other notes on all of these other um, bodies that were found. And Herman bought his mother's house in Massapequa Park in 1994. In 1994, there were also two other killings. Colleen McNamee and Rita Tangredi, which were 20 years later connected to a guy named John Bitroff, who was convicted and he's currently in jail for those two. Um, they were also, you know, I hate the term sex workers because to me that makes it seem like it's something that these girls or women want to do and they're doing it as a job that they want to do. And I don't think that that's always the case. But in any event, they were both also escorts, you know, whatever word you want to use. So he comes back to Long Island in 1994 before that he was living in New Jersey. The legs are found in April of 96, which we now know belonged to Karen Vergata. In 1997, that is when Peach's partial remains were found in Hempstead Lake Park. And then in 2000, uh, Jane Doe number six, who was later identified as Valerie Mack, who was also an escort from Philly, her partial remains, her torso was found in Manorville. And then in 2003, Jessica Taylor, who was known as Jane Doe number five, her torso was also found in Manorville. Yeah. So these were all in quick, you know, kind of quick succession between 96 and 2000. And then all we know is his next victims went missing in 2010. So there's a decade in between. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, my thought is that maybe in the beginning, when if, if he is tied to these, he was dismembering because it would be more difficult to identify a body back then in the 90s, correct me if I'm wrong, without Absolutely. fingerprints, right? Yes. So if you got rid of the hands, there were no fingerprints. You know, if the skull was separated from the torso, you know, dental records could be a way to identify somebody. But I don't remember, and you know better than me, what the technology was like in 96. Yeah, so DNA was there, but, you know, back then, the fingerprints, um, we would find body parts dumped in lots in Brooklyn, uh, and there would never be the hands there. There would never be the feet there. Those yeah. things, footprint, you know, as we know, when you're born in the hospital, they take a footprint for you, uh, for the babies. Yeah. Uh, and then um, fingerprints uh, and so forth. So that's how we would find, um, and, and, and I'm showing pictures of all of related here, but I, what I wanted to do too is I just wanted to, I wanted to read this um, article that I had up because I thought it was interesting. Uh, not so much this first one, but this one here, it says grizzly discovery. Suffolk County police are continuing their investigation. This obviously was from, um, 1996 in in April, uh, they're continuing Suffolk County Police continuing their investigation into the discovery of two disembodied female legs on a Blue Point Beach on Fire Island, according to Detective Sergeant Kevin Cronin of the Homicide Squad. The discovery of the legs believed to belong to the same woman were found by two brothers on Saturday at about 7 p.m. The limbs were discovered, police said, about a mile west of Davis Park on the bay side of the beach. Robert and Andrew, Robert and Andrew Ragona, Ragona, who own a summer home in Davis Park community, told police black garbage bags 
Now, these, this may seem very insignificant to people, but black garbage bags, right? So they have these black garbage bags, and they're, they had to have been wrapped up by somebody. And back in 96, there wasn't all of these CSI shows where people were educated on, hey, I better glove up when I do this. You know, so let's hope and pray that there was some mistakes as it pertains to Karen Regatta's uh, case and that whoever, whomever this is that's responsible for this, didn't take those precautions. And hopefully, crime scene back then uh, obtained what they can obtain. And look, the MVAC leaves me hope. I didn't ask Jared um, Bradley last night if he can MVAC a plastic garbage bag. But if they can, I'm sure as shit that they're going to be MVAC in that thing. Um, so black bags uh, contain a black, a black bag containing the body parts. Police investigated investigation. The case said they hoped the sc- that the scars on the body will help identify the victim. The legs were found with the toes, both of both the feet with red nail polish and both legs showed healed surgical scars at the ankles. In addition, according to police, the right leg has a three and a half inch scar on the posterior calf muscle and an L shaped scar on the shin. The left leg has a similar three and a half inch scar on the inner side of the calf muscle. Homicide detectives are seeking help. So I thought this was important for us to talk about this because, again, the technology then was limited. But fast forward to today and this task force, as we heard the district attorney say, once this task force got put together, the highest level of forensic technology is being used in this case. And I think that's what helped to now identify this 34 years, 34 year old victim, um, Karen. So it's, it's just, you know, bittersweet for the family here today, but they want to find a perpetrator linked to this because now you have the identification, but we don't have anybody in custody. That was the first question that the reporter answered, asked, do we have a suspect? And the obvious answer is no. Um, Ed Wallace is in the chat. Ed Wallace is in the chat, and he said, bags are great for fingerprints with vacuum metal deposition or crazy glue. With vacuum metal deposition, crazy glue. Okay. Wish Ed was here, but he's a, he's he's got a, he's teaching right now. So, um, but he's he's on his phone, probably taking a minute. Hold on, class, hold on a minute. I got to send a message to Duty Ron and, Melanie. Um, so you think they still have those garbage bags, Ed, and you think they could still so, recover fingerprints or maybe they got fingerprints that were just not in the system and now they have human's fingerprints and they can connect them, maybe? Those Is bags are booked into evidence. Absolutely. You don't, so if they got fingerprints off them, they'd still have that data. and Right. And if they didn't, uh, what I'm asking is fast forward to 2023. Could they do anything with it? So that's mm-hmm. that's something that that's um, a concern and, and and interesting. And Ed saying yes, DNA, yes, yes. Ed, I wish you can call in from like go to the bathroom. Hey, I got to take a break. Go into the bathroom in one of the stalls and, and call us. Uh, well, yeah, my question for him would be: Why did it take so long for them to identify her? You know, why um, has it taken 13 years to identify her? Has the technology improved? Absolutely. Um, was, were, were we just not running the DNA for the past th- 12 or 13 years? Or, you know, is this new technology that they identified her with? I'm curious about that. Again, they may right have. Now. They may have DNA from it, but from an unknown person. They, they may have the DNA. They're not saying anything. So maybe they have a profile or a partial profile but it doesn't come match to anybody in CODIS. Maybe this person didn't have a criminal history. AKA. No, I'm talking about the victim. Like, why did it take so long to identify Karen Vergata as Jane Doe? Like, do you think maybe the new um, publicity oh. surrounding this case made one of her family members come forward and say, right. oh, yeah, she went missing. Or, you know what I mean? I don't well, know how that The task happens. force took a buckle swab from her, uh, from some of her family. And they talked about familiar DNA. They made mention of 23andMe and Ancestry. We know that they don't share that information with police. So that was inaccurate reporting there. But they definitely had, um, 
they took the the the, bulk, the the buckle swab from her relatives um once they had i guess made somewhat of an identification so i don't know i i, I just don't know we're going to we're going to find out more about this as it goes forward i'm going to get ed's take on it um going forward but this this weekend i'm going to be down and out because i'm heading out to uh, connecticut with the missus so um sometime next week we'll do some stuff ed i know will keep me updated on um on any of this stuff and if he was here it would be fascinating to have this discussion but i have to get going because we got a long ride ahead of us and i gotta start heading out but melanie i want to thank you for being here and before we go uh, anything that you took away, and I know that you only heard what you heard. You yeah, know. no, I was listening to you in the car, so I heard the whole thing. I really didn't, okay. I didn't miss anything. Um, you know, justice for Karen Vergata and her family, and thank God that it, you know, it took a long time to identify her. Yeah. But um, thankfully, now her pam- family has some peace, hopefully, in in knowing that she's been found and identified. Absolutely. Tragic. Absolutely. You know, like I said, prayers and strength go out to her family, her friends, her, you know, her loved ones and everybody that's involved in this investigation. And we always want things to happen quickly. And unfortunately, in in this case, going back to 96, we know what kind of situation that Suffolk County, not only the police department, but the district attorney's office, they were in complete disarray and uh, totally totally uh, fudged up the this investigation um and and that's a fact um there's no sugarcoat in that there's no way we can sidestep that and get around it these um these victims were um uh, put put on the back burner because of politics and bullshit and criminal activity uh within the police department with the higher ups and um and the district district attorney's office one of uh, the one of these guys are still incarcerated right the former da uh, spoda yeah. is is still in jail so uh because of some bad seeds and and again this goes 99 percent of our law enforcement community are good people that want to have justice and want to seek yeah. justice but there's that one little small slither of bad that can just one bad apple can spoil it for all the good ones. And that's an unfortunate part of this case. And it's a part of this case that we have to make mention here. Um, Justice uh, has been delayed because of that. And shame, shame on them. Uh, There's no place to have criminals working within the agencies that go out and bring evil to justice. That's it. That's the best way I can put it, guys. Um, so I'm thankful for Rodney Harrison and the current task force that's in place. These seem like very good go-getters, men and women who are working, you know, vigorously to bring justice and to find answers. And that's all we can hope and pray and get behind. I support that. I know you do. Yeah, 100%. Right. And we don't support these shitty people who, uh, stalled this investigation for whatever reasons. May they be criminal, may they be personal, because someone didn't want to have uh, their name smeared all over the place. Well, too bad. It already happened. Um, yeah. uh, but it comes at a price. So on behalf of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Melanie Little uh, and Ed Wallace, we want to wish everyone, again, uh, a good weekend. But we're sending strength, prayers, and positive vibes to these families, as we keep saying here. Um, we can't say it enough. They've been through hell and back, and they need our support including Huerman's wife and, and, and his family. I mean, people are jumping on that bandwagon of bashing them. We're not going to do that here. There is no, no way. We are good people and we support huma- you, good human beings. All right. So thank you all for watching this press conference. Melanie, thank you for taking out the time. I got to run my wife's tap on her foot. So I got two things. It's just one, one quick thing before I go. The oh. GoFundMe for uh, ASA LRUP, which is what her uh, attorney called her ASA, I've been calling her ASA, is up to $28,000. So for all of you or any of you who donated, thank you so much uh, for donating. And um, we're hoping to, you know, maybe have a little part in helping her rebuild her life. 
And I did want to do the town hall. She's a victim as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. It's linked in the description, by the way. Um, I did want to do a town hall, but I, 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 got, I got to cut this thing short because I got to get out of here. But we did cover it all. Go back and watch the replay. If you're not yet subscribed, subscribe to my channel. Subscribe to Melanie Little. And uh, give this video a thumbs up. Share it out onto your social media platforms. Follow us on all things social media. One word, duty Ron. And follow Melanie Little. I'll have to, Melanie, please give me a chance. When I get to the hotel later, I'll link your stuff in the description. Don't worry. Happy birthday, Mrs. Duty Ron. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's coming up on Monday, so we're going to be there all weekend. And um, it's our favorite place uh, in the in this Northeast region. She loves it over there. So, uh, again, thank you to everyone watching. Thank you to the replay viewers. Thank you to the Super Chatters. I think I got to everybody. Um, and we will see you on the next one. God bless everybody, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.